couple of years ago, in fact, more than a couple of years ago now, seven or eight years ago, Ansel and I did what we always did when we had really, really little kids. And uh, we showed up at their school uh, to attend sort of their winter uh, party. And so I came from work and Angela came from home and we met in kind of that hurried parent moment where you just, uh, you just show up to see your kid. How many of you know if you put kids on stage, parents will show up? It's just, it's just true. Uh, and so it, the place was packed. It's like a school cafeteria. We go there and we're sitting in the first grader chairs that are blue and plastic and about you know, this high off the ground. And uh, everybody's there and I'm looking around and I'm seeing people from the community, all people we know from from days gone by and that our kids are in class with and all that kind of stuff. And, and our kids began to sing, uh, and, and that's what they were doing. They were singing about five songs for this winter, uh, winter party, and uh, they sang different kinds of songs. They sang Hanukkah songs. They sang Christmas songs. They sang a song from uh, Eid, which is an Islamic holiday that takes place in, uh, in, the, in the fall. And then also they sang a winter uh, solstice song. And I looked around like other Christians that I knew were in the room. Everybody was fidgety. You know what I mean? Like, what is going on in this place? You know, that kind of thing. But it's public school. And as I, uh, as I began to look around, I realized, like, well, that's my friend, and he's Jewish. He loved the Hanukkah song. That's my friend, and he's Muslim. He loved the Eid song. And, uh, and we have some pagan friends in the room, too, who are all about the winter solstice. And in fact, the songs they chose for the kids to sing that day perfectly matched the people of our community that were in, in the cafeteria that day. And I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, all of these people have come to this play or this program to see their kid, and they all come at God from so many different directions. Uh, the, the Jew comes this way through the law, and the, the Muslim comes this way through prayer and the law, the, the Quranic law. And, and the atheist, they come with a, a more of a, you know what, I, I, I develop truth from the inside out sort of way of thinking. And I, a Christian, I come, you know, wondering why the Christmas song is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that we're, we're singing. And, you know, all, all, we all are coming at God a different direction. I begin to think to myself. Um, you know, what would I say to my Muslim friend? What would I say to my Jewish friend, my agnostic or atheist friend about Christmas to say to them, this is why we celebrate Christmas and why it's distinct and different and unique. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, why we celebrate Christmas. And we'll do that from the context from Luke chapter 2. We call it the Christmas story, but this is really a story, a narrative, a historical narrative about the incarnation of Jesus. Incarnation is, means the enfleshing. It's like God put skin on and was born in a manger. It's a baffling concept to think about. Uh, but, but the scripture details this, and there are about four observations I would make that I would say, whether you're Jewish or atheist or agnostic or Christian or Muslim, you have to consider these four distinctives when you think about Christmas and the Christ of Christmas and why we celebrate this. So the, the first one is this, that God in the Christmas story, this story, Luke chapter 2, God is supernatural in a supernatural way and sovereign way working to make all this happen. Now, you might think, well, that's easy, easy to say. You're a pastor, but I'm not talking to my Jewish friend or atheistic friend. But, but listen, listen to what is history. Caesar Augustus. Anybody know who Caesar Augustus is? Right? Uh, we have this month called August named after Caesar Augustus. This is what kind of uh, a powerful dude that he is. Uh, every Latin-based language has a month that celebrates this guy. We just don't know that we're celebrating him. Caesar Augustus, the emperor, decrees the census. And, and what he does when he decrees the census, he thinks he's just taking account of all the people that he's in charge of, right? So this, for, for lack of a better word, I mean, for governing and all that, but Caesar Augustus wants to know how big his kingdom is. And so 
what it does is this decree causes this peasant sort of tecton, the, the word means stonemason, sometimes we say carpenter, from Nazareth named Joseph, who's betrothed to this, this girl named Mary, who's with child, to take a hike, basically, from Bethlehem, from Nazareth in the north, all the way by the Galilee, down into the Judean wilderness, five miles from Jerusalem to this little town called Bethlehem, which is where uh, his lineage is from. It's, it's his roots, it's, it's where he's at. He's got to go there and uh, be counted. And so in this, a powerful man thinks to himself, I'm going to count my kingdom. And God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my kingdom explode. And so this peasant who would have never taken that hot hike with a, with a, bet, you know, a, a betrothed uh, future wife who is now pregnant, and, and it's a hard hike anyway, and, and he has to take it all the way to, to Bethlehem, he would have never done that except Caesar Augustus makes him. But God is using uh, all of it. And, and not just that, but where he has to go to and his lineage is all in God's plan. You see, God said in his word that he would cause a, a root to come up. It would be a root of David and there would be one that would shepherd his kingdom like no other, no other like ha, who had never been before. And in all of this story, God is aligning the stars for the birth of of his son so that it makes sense to everybody. Now, the second sort of clear observation I would make here is that the message of Christmas is not just news, it's long-awaited good news. Now, you pick up at Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says this, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. So these shepherds, which is a common, uh, in fact, some, some would say even lower class sort of person in that day, but Bethlehem is full of shepherds. It's a, it's a sheep town, so to speak, in those, those days. These shepherds are out in the hillside, just outside of Bethlehem. And they are uh, in the dark. And the angel appears, and it says the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. They were full of fear, and we would be too if we were out in the middle of nowhere in the dark, and an angel appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, lit the place up. And it says, uh, the angel said to them in verse 10, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So we, we begin to understand that this is good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now, this is a bigger deal than you might think. Because for the people of Israel, they understood in that moment that God spoke to them through the Hebrew Bible, the Torah and the writings, and the prophets, guys like Isaiah and Micah. And at the moment that this angel is saying, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. This is the first time that there has been a word from the Lord since 400 years ago when the last prophet spoke, right? So it's been 700 years since guys like Isaiah and Micah said anything like thus saith the Lord. So these people have been waiting to hear from the Lord, which the Torah and the, the writings, they all point to a coming Messiah. They have been waiting to hear from the Lord for 400 years. Now, how old is the United States of America? I mean, we're talking, waiting to hear from the Lord for a longer time than this country has been in place. They've been waiting and waiting. And when the sky splits and when the angel shows up and he brings this good news of great joy, this is not just good news, but it is long-awaited news. So sovereignly, God has supernaturally aligned everything so that it'll make sense when this news is shared. And this news people were on pens and needles for, from generation to generation, waiting for the prophets 
their words to be fulfilled. It's not just news, it's long-awaited good news. Now, the third sort of observation I'd make here is that when we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birth of a unique, one-of-a-kind Savior. There is none like Him. And I'll show you from the text. The scripture first says, this is the contents of the good news that the angels, angels shared. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day. Let's just take that phrase for a minute. For unto you is born this day. That phrase is uttered by no accident because you see, it's the same phrase that the prophet Isaiah used 700 years before to tell us that this day that we're celebrating right now and reading about in the text, that this day would come. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So when these Hebrew shepherds hear, for unto you is born, it is bookends for Isaiah who said, for to us, a child is born. 700 years earlier, now the prophecy is being fulfilled in their presence. It says this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Now Luke chapter 2, 4 and 5 tells us that the city of David is Bethlehem. And Jesus is specifically born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy through the prophet Micah, who spoke this word 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Micah chapter 5, 2 to 5, it says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. So this day, this child that is born in the place Bethlehem, perfectly orchestrated by God, is fulfilling age-old prophecy that everybody is waiting for to be fulfilled. Now, the the scripture goes on, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. And Jesus gets this term, uh, savior. Matthew 1, 21, the gospel says, she will bear a son, meaning Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, right? So we're not talking about just any savior, we're talking about the Savior. We're not talking about a Savior that is like the hero that, that pushed you know, the lady out of the way of the speeding car that was coming by and saved the day for that day. Not talking about the guy who jumped in front of a bullet and saved the day for somebody else on that, for that one life that particular day. We're talking about a Savior that saves people from their sins. And this is very specific according to the text. This baby who is being born in the fulfillment of prophecy, he's a savior, but he's a savior like no other. He's a savior that saves people from their sins. Now, who else can do that? No one. No one. He is the savior. He's given a title here. Uh, He was born in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, the word Christ means anointed one, the one sent to redeem the the world. The word Lord means master, uh, supernatural ruler. So this is an anointed redeemer who is the master over everything who has come to save us perfectly by being born in a manger in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy at the supernatural uh, sovereign hand of God. This is becoming crystal clear to us that this is the one who is the way to God and the way to forgiveness of sins. Now, if that wasn't enough, the the angel said to the shepherds, 
Uh, and this will be a sign to you, verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, these shepherds understand where this manger is. For one thing, Bethlehem is tiny. For two, the second thing, they are shepherds and they use these shepherds' caves to give their sheep shelter. They've used them over and over and over again. They know where each cave is and they easily find the manger. When they go to the manger, they, they, they find just that, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. As if it wasn't enough for the shepherds that he was fulfilling the Isaiah prophecy and the Micah prophecy and that they had seen an angel and that the glory of the Lord had shone around them. Now they go to the manger, to the shepherd's cave. And just like the angel said, there he is with Mary and Joseph lying in a manger. And that sign validates everything else the angel says to them. He's the Savior. He's Christ the Lord. They believe it. They're filled with joy. They go out telling everyone about it. Now, Isaiah, the prophet, again, 700 years before this took place, he also said, here's your sign. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, why, what would I tell my atheist friend or my Jewish friend or my Muslim friend or my agnostic friend about, or even my religious Christian friend that doesn't even know the gospel? What would I tell them about what it means to celebrate Christmas? At first, I would, I would tell them all about Jesus. And I would use Luke chapter two and I would just show them, look at the beautiful fulfillment of the prophecy and how God was working. It was exactly like he said it would be. And we can prove that Isaiah was written 700 years before Luke chapter two was uh, taking place. And we can prove that Micah was written 700 years before Luke chapter two is taking place. It's a sign to us so that we can all see. The problem is not every one of our friends are just going to take that. They're going to ask another question. And the question is, okay, if that's true, then tell me what this Jesus who was born in a manger and fulfilled all this prophecy and, you know, uh, is, is this, this incarnation thing in the manger with a virgin Mary and Joseph and all, all that. Tell me how he's made a difference in your life, how he's changed your life, what he's done. I have one word that I would share. It's a three-letter word. It's the word joy. J-O-Y. Joy. You see, joy is characteristic of a relationship with the Jesus that was born in a manger. Joy is not necessarily characteristic of any other God that anybody worships, not real joy, but it is of Jesus. Listen to what the word, word says. Do you know in Luke chapter 1, verse 44, this crazy thing happens where Elizabeth the mother of John the Baptist and Mary's cousin. Elizabeth is pregnant and John the Baptist is in her womb in Luke chapter one. Mary goes to meet with Elizabeth and, and Elizabeth hears Mary's voice. And when they come close, John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb leaps. And the, the text says in Luke chapter one, verse 44, that John leapt for joy inside the womb. Joy. I can imagine Mary and Elizabeth, really, they're probably two, they look like two kids to us. See, they hadn't seen each other in a while. They hug for the first time. Those baby bumps kind of meet in the middle. And John and Jesus are the clo so close. John's the one that's going to say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. And John jumps. It says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. He leapt for joy. And this joy thread, it starts there, but it doesn't end there. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says, The angels brought good news of great what? Joy. 
John chapter 15, verse 11, after Jesus gets done teaching his disciples what it means to hang out with me. How do you abide is the word that he uses. Stay connected to me. What, is, what does that produce in your life? John 15, 11, he says, I've said all this to you so that your joy may be, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Because a relationship with Christ is characterized by joy. It may be unspeakable joy. It may be unexplainable joy in so many ways, but it's characterized by joy. When Jesus, after he was born in this manger, he lived 30 some odd years, the Bible says, sinlessly. He never sinned. And he went and ended up uh, intentionally in Jerusalem again to fulfill prophecy, just five miles from where he was born, to be crucified. And the scripture says that he was crucified as a propitiation for my sin and for your sin. He, He was a substitute for the penalty. He took the wrath of God. And he was the only one that could do it because he was the fulfillment of all that prophecy. He was born when he should have been born, how he should have been born, to whom he should have been born in the right place. And then he lived sinlessly. And then he fulfilled all this prophecy again and was crucified. And then three days later, he fulfilled more prophecy and he was raised again to new life. And then 50 days later, he ascended from the Mount of Olives to heaven. And when he ascended, he said, I'm leaving with you the Holy Spirit. And he fills the disciples with his Holy Spirit, the believers. And they go out with this gospel message. And Philip goes to Samaria. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that uh, that they were going to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so Philip takes the gospel to Samaria. And when he gets to Samaria, the Bible says that in Samaria, the people listened with one accord. They were intent, like tell us about this Jesus, this one that was born in Bethlehem. Tell us about this gospel. And as he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ as Lord, he's the Savior who saves us from our sins, and they begin to confess him as Lord, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. The the text says in Acts chapter 8, do you know what began to happen when they received the Holy Spirit after confessing Christ as Savior and Lord? That the bondage of sin was broken, and evil spirits started going out of people, out of the town. It sounds crazy to us, but Acts chapter 8, verse 8 says, after all the the sin was broken and evil spirits began to go out, it says verbatim, so there was much joy in that city. Because you see, when Jesus shows up and frees people, because he's the Savior, frees people from sin and evil, that goes out and joy comes in. And that's exactly what happened to the people of Samaria, but not just in Samaria. The disciples one day went to a place called Iconium, and when they got to Iconium with the same gospel message, the people of Iconium pushed back. They had lots of different gods. They had lots of money. They didn't really want to hear about a peasant savior born in a no-name town called Bethlehem. And after they had shared the gospel and shared the gospel and shared the gospel, and nobody was receiving this gospel message, the people began to push them out of the town. And when they got to the town's edge, they took off their sandals and they clapped them. And it says they shook the dust off their feet. And it's funny because, okay, so they're being run out of town. They've had no fruit. Their ministry has been miserable and not a success in a a human way. And it says in Acts chapter 13, verse 52, after they shook the dust off their feet, they were filled with what? Joy. I mean, When your circumstances are bad, how can you be filled with joy? It's only because of Jesus who was born in Bethlehem to fulfill all the prophecy. It is the good news of great joy. It's not dependent on your circumstances. It comes from the inside out because of Jesus inside of you if you have a relationship with him. This is joy. Um, In our world today, two things. Um, One, Jesus said of his believers, in this world, you will have trouble, trouble. There was never any, there's never ever, please hear me, there's never ever any idea in the gospel that because you come to Christ and confess him as Lord, your life will all of a sudden be perfect. In fact, it says you will have trouble. 
You will face what the disciples did, persecution. You will have that. Your circumstances won't always be great. But it goes on to say, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is the joy giver, and that joy is in spite of our circumstances. I was uh, in the grocery store today. Anybody try that out? Wow. Like, I'm not a grocery store guy anyway, typically, but I I had some time, and I ran an errand uh, to pick up some things we needed for tonight, and uh, it was a madhouse at the grocery store. And everybody were using their carts as weapons. I only had a, a basket, but I saw, I saw this one lady run into the back of this other lady. And the other lady looked at her, and this lady just rolled her eyes and then went around the other way. That is a picture of the absence of joy <laughs> at this Christmas season. It sounds like a funny thing, but do you know we live in a world where anger or pride or uh, grief or depression, all these things are more prevalent than joy. And what is the antidote to all of that? What is the, what is the way to survive in a world that, and this is the second thing I want to say, our world is crazy. Our world is crazy. If you watch the news, let me tell you a secret. You watch the news and you think, I'm glad I don't live in Jerusalem or Beirut because it's crazy over there. Everybody's blowing everybody up. In Beirut and Jerusalem, they watch the news and say, I'm glad I don't live in Houston. Everybody carjacks everybody and murders each other. Don't go to Houston, kids. It's true. It's not a joke. It's true. Because the world is crazy. It's full of, full of evil, right? And so, so how, do, how, do you, how do you survive in the midst of that when crazy, crazy people, cra- craziness abounds in the world? And the answer is by understanding who the Jesus is that's born in the manger, that lives sinlessly, that died on a cross to save you, the Savior, save you from your sins. Here's where my joy comes from. I don't mean the fake, I don't mean the fake Christian joy, churchy joy, that's a better word. You know what I mean? Like where I'm at church now, so I got to put my church face on, and every, even though the, this week has been terrible and I feel like throwing up, I'm good. I, everything's good. God is good all the time. You know that, that whole thing? He is. It's true. But I'm t- not talking about faking. I'm talking about real joy. Where does my joy come from? My joy stems from a very simple concept. If there were someone that could keep track of all of my sins one by one over the last 42 years, the the, the list would probably go to 518, maybe further. I don't know. I can't even, I can tell you some of the big ones, but I can't even keep track of all of, the sin, the, all of the things that would be considered sin in my life over the last 42 years. And if I were to stand before a holy God and they were to pull out that list, the only thing I can imagine is that I would, I would be humiliated before a perfect and holy God. I would be embarrassed before all, any other people that were standing there while this list was, was being uh, read. And I would be in bondage because I would... I would, I would I would be doomed. I would, I would not pass judgment here. Because the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. I mean, I would not pass judgment. But the source of my joy is the mediator, Jesus, who was born on the manger, in the manger to fulfill all the prophecy, went to the cross to fulfill all the prophecy, lived sinlessly, selflessly, and sacrificially, took the penalty, the wrath of God for my sake and anyone who would call on his name for salvation took the penalty and the scripture says he's a mediator. So in that moment when this list that goes to 518 is read one by one by one and I'm fearing embarrassment and I'm fearful of a holy God and I'm humiliated and all these things, Jesus steps in as my mediator and says, I took all this. I'm the one that was born in in Bethlehem, the second person of the Trinity. I'm the only virgin birth. 
I'm the only one that is the Alpha and the Omega and that was born. I'm the only one that went to a, a cross and didn't deserve it, faced a trial and didn't deserve it, and also rose again and defeated the penalty of sin and death. So for Brian, Brian uh, has my blood all over him. And the father would say, Brian, I made a place for you with Jesus and all the other believers. John, the book of John says it's a room, a room, like a room. I made a place for you and you'll be here. You'll be here with me eternity and I have work for you to do in my name and my kingdom for, for you, his glory, for my, my glory. And you come in, you're my son, inherit all of it. And, and my joy comes from there, from there. Earlier this week, you ever have one of those days where the sewage starts backing up into your bathtub? Anybody ever done that? It was me this week. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking, Lord, it's Christmas. <laughs> it's Christmas, Lord. Why? What have I done? And I was reminded simply, you know what? This is an easy, easy fix. We can handle this. A clogged pipe. We can handle this. Your circumstances don't dictate your joy. Jesus, prophetically born to Mary and Joseph in a manger in Bethlehem, he's your source of joy. So how has he changed my life? He gave me joy when I should have none. So what would you say to your Muslim friend or your Jewish friend or your atheist friend or your agnostic friend about why we celebrate Christmas? I would say, because Jesus is uniquely, distinctly the only way to God and forgiveness of sins, according to the scripture. And he's put joy in me. And even if you don't believe all of that other, I've got joy.